Can people hear me online? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I think we should uh, we should stop now uh, with a mixed uh, in room and online um, audience. Uh, thank you a lot for uh, bearing with us uh, with our uh, little delay. Um, it's not always easy to organize things in real life either. But um, no more talk. Uh, we are, uh, I'm so happy to introduce the second keynote speaker in this conference, Professor Kay O'Hanoran from the University of Liverpool, uh, Head of Department of Communication and Media, School of the Arts. Also, a number of other things, affiliations uh, and uh, biography. I will uh, not go into details about that um, due to uh, time, because I think uh, you want to hear the keynote presenter and not me. So I will just introduce the talk called Matter, Meaning and Semiotics, please. Great, thank you so much for the introduction. I'll just share my screen now. Um, okay. So everyone can see that, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, okay, so the talk is matter, meaning and semiotics. Um, and briefly what I'd like to cover is sort of an introduction, you know, to this notion of matter and meaning as being the two major realms of human experience. And then, you know, we can look at history as the interplay between these dimensions, these realms the, you know, of matter and meaning, and then take a look at the different systems that are involved um, if we're talking about the human experience and the human condition, the human situation. A very, very quick look at the evolution of human semiosis with a view to getting into looking at um, mathematics, science and technology as a stepping stone to the, the world we're living in at the moment, which is the digital age and the implications for our field, which I think are immense, um, given the way the world is operating at the moment. Okay, so the basic premise here, and this comes from Michael Halliday's paper from 2005 on matter and meaning, the two realms of human experience, we as humans have two realms, the physical realm, the realm of matter, and also the world of meaning that we make within all of that world. And so the interplay between the two, this constant human experience of the physical, the material, um, and the world of meaning um, defines the human condition, basically for the individual, um, the social unit, the state, and the human race as a whole. So if we take that perspective and think about the human condition in these um, terms, where does that leave us in terms of, of semiotics? Okay, from matter, we, we have the term, it's easy, we can say it's the physical world, it's the material world. Um, when we're talking about the world of meaning, you know, in, in a sense, the semiosphere, which we, we sort of operate in, it's not that easy. We don't have any objective. And so what we can do is we can go to the Greek and we call it semiotic, um, you know, basically the field within which we, we're all working. And so the two realms um, that we inhabit in that regard then are the material and the semiotic, and both are involved in all regions of our experience. And that's starting from Halliday's paper, 2005 paper. Okay, so let's take semiotic to mean meanings of all kinds, linguistic, visual, oral, and so forth, architectural, music, you know. In fact, I would look at culture as being a set of interacting systems of meaning. And we take semantic then to mean, you know, meanings made in language, for example, linguistic meanings. And this is where it becomes very interesting about the term, the use of semantic. Um, basically, semantics was sort of replaced with cognitive, um, in the 1980s, and I'm talking about linguistics here. And although mainstream formal linguistics excluded meaning or just reduced it sort of to a secondary position in relation to syntax, meaning is central in cognitive linguistics and cognitive sort of semiotics. But as Halliday claims, and I think it's an important thing to remember, is that having you know, cognitive linguistics, it doesn't take into account the semantic stratum in the organization of language itself. In other words, language is organized to make certain meanings and meanings come out of that as a, at a different stratum. 
Okay, so let's then, if we take this position and we look at human history, we can think about it being as this constant interplay in tension between, you know, the physical world which we inhabit um, and the world of meaning within which we exchange, you know, and live our lives. That is the constant tension and interplay between the physical and the material world and the semiotic. This is sort of easy to see when you look very, very quickly at the ages that we've been through, the, you know, the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, the Machine Age, and the age that we're interested in now, the world that we live in is the Information Age. And what we can see over this time is a shift um, from basically humans involved in transforming the material world through the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, into transforming energy into sort of, you know, the industrial age and the age of machinery. And basically those ages were concerned with the physical, transforming the physical sort of world. And, you know, we can see this sort of, in a sense, in the way that, you know, academia and universities are organized and the huge emphasis on the sciences, because basically, historically, this is what has been the major concern. And what's interesting uh, for us and extremely significant is the world that we're dealing with at the moment is a semiotic world. We're into the age of information, you know, according to this um, based on Hilbert 2020, you know, from about the 70s onwards, it's about transforming information. And this is hugely significant for our field because really it is time, you know, that in, in terms of what is run, you know, the major controls in the world are about transforming information. And my question, and I don't have an answer for it today, is what's our role within this new world, um, the information age? Okay, so where we're at is computers have extended human semiotic power in the ways that machines extended material power. And that's been our history, you know, the control over the material world. And when I look at maths and science, you know, just a moment, we'll, and technology, we, we can see, you know, that that has been the emphasis. But I think we are in the world of information now, the digital age, but it's always important to remember that humans created the computer and humans control the digital technology, the algorithms and the meanings it made. It's, it's still part of who we are and what we do. And Zuboff in her fantastic book in 2019, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, makes this point very clearly. These digital worlds don't just exist, they are man-made, we control them. Um, and it's up to us to make decisions about, you know, what the nature of that is um, in terms of how things unfold from here, given the, the huge number of concerns about, you know, what's happening today in the digital age. Okay, so, but interestingly enough, scientists have methods um, for measuring the amount of information, but they lack sophisticated methods to deal with its meaning. And basically, I mean, semiotics has been, you know, sort of backgrounded for so long. Um, and the sort of knowledge that we have about meaning and the ways that meanings are made. Scientists don't actually have access to that because they're not, many of them, I'm not saying all of them, some of them obviously are trained in linguistics and so forth, but they do at the moment currently lack uh, sophisticated methods to deal with this world of meaning, the, the human realm of meaning. Okay, so let's take a look at these two dimensions. And this is, you know, the dichotomy, of course, is, is not um, absolute because we've got matter and meaning. But of course, meaning depends on matter to be realized. And we use meaning to organize matter. So there's an interaction between, they're not two separate, you know, realms. They, they interact with each other, these two realms of human experience um, and so forth. But let's have a look at the different systems that are involved if we're talking about matter and meaning. We can talk about physical systems, we can talk about biological systems, uh, social systems and semiotic systems. And they're sort of like distributed across, you know, according to which end of these sorts of uh, dimensions we wanna talk about. And so we've got all these systems we're trying to deal with um, and um, all systems are constructed of matter. Okay, so in a sense, what we've got is we've got physical systems, which of course are made of physical matter. Um, we've got biological systems, which are made of physical matter as well, but they've got the added dimension, you know, of course, of life. And then if we go on to social systems, um, they are made up of biological systems, you know, humans themselves, which of course are made up of matter. And of course the most complex, and this is where we come in, is semiotic systems. 
because they are made up of social systems, biological systems and physical systems. So as Halliday you know, claims in, in this paper in 2005, we're really in a fourth order of complexity when we're dealing with semiotic systems. And we could make the argument that the, you know, what we study is the most complex um, of all, the notion of this human semiosis and human semiotic systems. Okay, so if we look at these uh, semiotic systems, that we know they're transmitted physically. They're made up of sort of matter through sound waves, light waves, and objects. So, you know, we, we have to obviously sense them. We, we receive them biologically uh, by the human brain and associated senses. And we've got all sense to, you know, take in this, um, you know, these different sort of semiotic sort of signs as, as they're made. Um, hearing, sight, touch, smell, and so forth, um, in, in addition to the other senses that we have, of course, which is balance, body position, movement, pain, and temperature. And the interesting thing is that these semiotic systems and semiotic choices and meanings are exchanged socially um, in context defined by the social structure and culture. So although we may process them cognitively, the actual human semiosis takes place socially um, within different contexts where the meaning you know, is made according to that context. And as Halliday claims, you know, the, um, basically semiotic systems are organized as systems of meaning where we've got a certain meaning potential. In other words, different semiotic resources, linguistic, visual, and so forth, you know, we can, we can formalize them in terms of systems of meaning with a meaning potential. Um, in other words, each semiotic system is organized to make a range of different sorts of meanings. And in any instance, what you get is a specific choice from those different systems. And the key thing is that it's not any individual semiotic choice, it's the integration and combination of semiotic choices where meaning actually is made. And so really, you know, I'm gonna be focusing on this, this notion of meaning potential and the, what different resources can do and the significance um, of when, um, significance of when the choices combine. Okay, so if, you know, the, the approach I'm using is a social semiotic approach, um, and it accounts for how semiotic resources are used to construct and enact meaning. Okay, so I think there's two key points to here is that many people when they think about meaning, what they think about is content, they think about representations of the world. But of course, we use semiotic resources also to enact in other words, enact social uh, relations and social processes. So, you know, following Halliday, um, you know, and if we want to think about language and other resources as having a grammar, in other words, sort of a range of different systems through which meaning is made, then the grammar both construes and enacts. In other words, it can enacts the social process, our relations with each other and our stance about the world. And it also construes the human experience, our knowledge about the world. Um, and in systemic functional linguistics, which is, you know, the sort of the way that Halliday developed this notion of social semiotics, he did it most fully within the field of, of uh, systemic functional linguistics. And he refers, and people within the field refer to them as metafunctions, the interpersonal metafunction and the experiential metafunction. And so the complexity of semiosis is the fact that there are multiple strands of meaning being made simultaneously you know, in, any, in any situation. Okay, so one of the key principles that I want to think about is language and other semiotic resources viewed as systems. And in any instance, what you do is you get um, particular choices made um, in any instance. And in a sense, language and the other resources as well realize this four meta functions. So in that notion of representing and enacting, we're talking about four different meta functions. Okay, so if we're thinking now about the world of meaning, you know, we've got matter and we've got meaning and humans, you know, are dealing with these two realms simultaneously, and we're talking about semiotic resources, we can think about semiotic resources making experiential meaning, in other words, constructing the world as, as a series of happenings. And with language, what we do is we logically connect those um, happenings um, while we're simultaneously enacting social relations and stance. Um, and this is all being organized in terms of coherent messages. So I'm doing this right at this moment. I'm constructing some ideas about happenings in the world, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm phrasing things in terms of, you know, uh, of what I mean by meaning and matter and so forth. I'm logically connecting what I'm saying. 
I'm interacting with you. Um, it's a very one-way delivery. I'm in a position of power, obviously, because I'm giving the talk, but nonetheless, social relations are being acted at the moment. And I've got a stance towards things as I evaluate things as, as I'm speaking. And hopefully this is being organized into a coherent message. Okay, as, as you know, many of you will know, of course, the social semiotic approach that Halliday developed and um, fully developed as systemic functional linguistics has been extended to other resources, you know, over the past several decades, uh, most famously by Chris and Van Leuven, with, and there's the third edition out of Reading Images, uh, displayed out by Michael O'Toole, who was my supervisor. I've done a lot of work in mathematics, um, which was the area in which I came into this field looking at mathematics discourse. And of course, we've still got, we've got sound and music, and these are just, for example, you know, semiotic resources have been explored from this perspective, you know, in terms of space and architecture and so forth. Um, and the field is generally called multimodality, uh, multimodal analysis and multimodal semiotics. I would refer to it as semiotics. Um, multimodal was sort of a term that came in to look at, I used to call it um, multi-semiotics um, or semiotics, but multimodality and multimodal analysis came the term that was used within this field, which I use now as well, basically meaning that we're looking at not um, semiotic resources in isolation, but the integration of them. Um, so that's, you know, really what multimodal means, the integration of different modes. Okay, so let, let's think about this then in human history. Um, it's always interesting to reflect back and you think about how semio, semiosis has, human semiosis has expanded throughout human history. You know, there was speech and, and so forth, and which developed into writing. And uh, then we have mathematics and then science and computing and the internet. And of course, this is all very much closely related to technology. Um, you know, the, we could have writing and the printing press and the printing press basically led uh, to the scientific revolution because you could actually record different ideas um, and people could circulate them and understand them and build on them. And certainly that is the case with mathematics, which, which evolved as a written sort of discourse. So technology is very much involved in these different stages of human semiosis as we expand the meaning potential, you know, that we can make right up to the digital age now. Okay, so let's have a very, very quick look at maths and science, just to point out a few key things about this interaction between uh, matter and meaning. Okay, if we have a semiotic framework for language, a linguistic sort of framework for language, which, you know, the one that I use is developed from systemic functional linguistics, and we had a semiotic framework for the symbolism, uh, which is based on the model from language, because if you look historically, what you'll see is that mathematical symbolism, you know, derived from, you know, the linguistic where certain elements were symbolized, um, you know, given their process of participants, but basically in a written text until um, it developed as a fully fledged semiotic resource on its own with its limitations. I mean, it can't, you can't do everything obviously with mathematical symbolism, but it actually evolved to serve certain purposes. Um, and that is what I'll discuss now in the next few minutes. Um, and if we had a semiotic framework for mathematical diagrams and graphs, what becomes, you know, very um, significant is then there's a comprehensive approach for looking at analysing language, mathematical images and the symbolism and their integration in mathematics discourse. And from that perspective, um, one can actually see how the different resources are organised, uh, what functions they serve, and what happens when they integrate um, and basically what meanings we can make within maths and science. And the reason that this is so significant is it's basically changed the face of life on earth. I mean, if you look at the notion of mathematics and re-representing the world in a new way, and we've got the whole, you know, bit of the science, it, it, we're, we're in the situation we're in now because of the semiotic construction uh, to the point where we may are in danger of destroying the whole planet. So um, what the, I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that if we develop these sort of frameworks for understanding semiosis and different semiotic resources and the sorts of meanings that can be made, we're in a position then to see, you know, the, the implications and the functions of these different discourses and what's missing and, and what needs to be done. Okay, so number one, it, if we've got this framework, it's key, you know, it's possible to understand the semantic expansions and the grammatical strategies through which these expansions are achieved, uh, to trace historically what's happened uh, with mathematics and science, to account for the nature of scientific language. And this, 
is a really important part because in a sense, scientific language evolved to serve the, the purposes of science because you had the symbolism and you had the images. However, scientific language today is used across every realm of human experience and you get these very metaphorical sort of constructions of life across different dimensions where scientific language didn't even actually develop, you know, to serve purposes. So it's been imported across just about every dimension of what we're doing. And as a result, we have very abstract constructions about the human condition, which um, embed will basically change the meanings of them and allow arguments to be made, which are not even, I guess, related to the reality that we're trying to describe. And so in all of this, I guess, you know, once we understand semiosis and how it works across different fields, you know, we can make tangible this interplay between matter and meaning, which is not insignificant when you look at the state of, of the world today. Okay, very, very quickly, I like always going back historically, some of these diagrams are absolutely fascinating. This is very early Tartaglia's like new science from, you know, before the scientific revolution at the beginning of, of the scientific revolution. And of course, it was all about measuring, it was about the material world, you know, having devices to measure certain things, and then sem semitize them. Because as we can see in the second one, what we've got, of course, is a triangle, we've got, you know, we're measuring angles and so forth. And a lot of this work was basically control over the material environment, development of arms and weaponry, you know, in order to conquer and, and take control. Um, these, I think these, these images are being touched up because when you look at the original, it's black and white. And what's interesting in this, of course, is you've got this running text because in a sense at this stage in human history, the mathematical symbolism had not been developed as a fully fledged semiotic resource in its own right. Um, because basically, you know, the, um, we were trying to, well, at that time, what was trying to be used is you had, you know, te technology, you know, sort of measuring instruments and so forth, and you had language and you had the images, but it, it wasn't developed, you know, modern mathematics had not been developed at that stage. Um, this is another one where you can clearly see, this is from the same book, um, you know, the, the object and the context of all these images is there. It was about firing a cannon in order to hit a building. Um, it was about, you know, measuring the heights of different castles and everything, you know, for, for people that were trying to invade. And so this is a history, you know, of, of, of mathematics and science, understanding this, you know, the material world and describing it, you know, basically for the purposes of prediction. Um, and you can see within the same book, you know, you've got then the, the abstract semiotic construction of it, all the context has disappeared with the canon and so forth. You know, we've got curves and we've got, you know, this is basically an eye looking at the different sort of curves. Or if you fired a cannon and it went like that, where would it drop? And then you've got the semiotic construction of, you know, the points and lines and so forth. And this really took off um, basically with Descartes because in a sense, what Descartes did was he connected these visual descriptions to algebraic descriptions in the analytical geometry. And so what we had at this stage then is that those curves and those lines and those semi visual semiotic constructions could be described exactly um, using mathematical symbolism. And so you've got then this close connection between the two. And as we can see, you know, through um, the geometry, you can see then the symbolism becoming, you know, and being involved as a semiotic resource in its own right with its own grammar and being set apart basically from, from the linguistic construction. And this is the key, key part that mathematics and science works through these interactions between these different semiotic resources, the linguistic, the visual and the symbolic, hence its power. And um, I'll talk in just a minute about how that power comes about, about because I think it's instructive to look at this and then look, think about other realms of meaning and how semiotic resources actually interact. After this, of course, you had Newton come along, you know, with the calculus, um, basically looking at, you know, trying to capture and map change, rates of change in order basically for prediction. And what you've got in this image here is, you know, a bird flying. You've got the semiotic constructions of the lines. You've got the angle of the rifles with a prediction that at this particular point, if I, we fire this here, we will hit this. Um, and, and the calculus was developed. And as I said earlier on, what was key to this was, you know, the printing press, that these semiotic constructions and the mathematical symbolism were standardized so they could be circulated and built upon. Um, it doesn't mean it was just done overnight. There's, there's like 
so much history in the development of mathematical symbolism and they were subject to political kind of debates and discussions and, and the same sorts of human behavior we find everywhere. Um, and if you ever want an account of that, I mean, I'll, I'll show you in just a minute, Kajori did a fantastic book on, on the history of mathematical notation. But if we go to Leibniz now, and this is from the archive, what you'll see is what Leibniz did was he realized the significance of a semiotic sort of form of mathematical symbolism. And he focused on trying to get um, a sort of a grammar, an underlying way of organizing the symbolism, which was concise, um, which captured the meanings that were required and which could be used for logical meaning. And so in a sense, you know, the, these, these sort of original manuscripts, you know, are again, fascinating. This is when he was losing his sight and he was really trying to cram a lot in, um, in a small space. So in a sense, um, what Leibniz did, I mean, and the two of them, Newton and Leibniz, you know, developed uh, calculus around the same time. But Leibniz attracts so much importance to the development of symbolism, believing it was essential to mathematics, which of course it was. Um, and he was a semiotician. I mean, he, he paid attention to the resource and developed it as a tool for thinking and paid specific attention to the, the underlying systems through which, you know, it, it was organized to make meaning. And in a sense, really what we have is that the focus of these constructions was actually the experiential capturing relations and patterns and logical meaning to be able to logically deduce from that. And so in a sense, what the symbolism did is it took the realm of human experience as expressed linguistically, but narrowed it down to a certain domain and then expanded that domain um, and hence basically rewrote the world. Um, but it, it, it's interesting because all human sort of semiotic systems are functional. They're designed for specific purposes. And we can see what the purposes are by actually studying, you know, the different, you know, the different types of resources that are involved and their integration. And this is the book that I mentioned earlier, History of Mathematical Notations, fascinating read, um, a really comprehensive description of the centuries of development of, of, of the symbolism. Okay, so um, I've moved through, you know, different sections here. Um, I've been through, you know, um, sort of human semiosis and over time, and I'm looking still at maths and science and technology. Um, I think this is really significant because if you want to look at the interaction between matter and meaning, you know, it comes together with maths and science, which was basically about trying to, you know, capture um, and understand and predict, you know, the material environment. The significance of the integration of the linguistic, the visual and symbolic in maths and science cannot be understated. What happens, and, and I would say this is what happens in other realms of human semiosis as well, is that when you're using multiple resources, you can access the meaning potential of each resource, which is different. The meaning potential of uh, language is different to the meaning potential of the symbolism is different to the meaning potential of images. Um, and so you can, when you've got through the resources, you can access that meaning potential as you're constructing a text. And this of course goes for anything, whether it be a music video or a popular culture or, or whatever, uh, a play, a film, whatever. Um, what happens when you move across these different resources is there can be metaphorical expansions of meaning. And this is the second element. You not only get access to the meaning potential of the different resources, but you get metaphorical expansions of meaning across. Um, for example, in, in mathematics, an entity in language um, as, a, as a thing can be a re relations in the images which can be configurations of mathematical processes, participants and circumstance and the symbolism. And it's this key integration, which gives you the semantic expansions and explains our, you know, sort of semiotic potential. Just very, very quickly looking at this, for example, this is, this is you know, lower high school mathematics. Um, if we look at the linguistic constructions, what we see is their nouns, their kind of dense entities. And this is the nature of a lot of sim, um, scientific writing. And if you look at the text with, within this actual script, you've got given two functions, um, fx and gx. The composite function of g and x is the function which maps g onto g, f, g and x. Um, so in other words, a lot of scientific discourse is made up of extended nominal groups, nouns, uh, which are related through relational processes. This is this, this is this, therefore this is this. Um, and if you have a look at this text here, you'll see that. 
And so this, and as I said earlier, this scientific, heavy, dense, semantically dense um, sort of construction of the world are used in all sorts of contexts, you know, um, you know, from, from economics to politics to you name it, you know, we've got these very sort of abstract constructions which allow rhetorical arguments to be made, you know, using, using these very metaphorical entities. Now, at the same time within this mathematics text, so that's what language evolved to do. And the reason for it is what, you, what was happening is the dynamic aspect of the um, construction of the world um, was captured through visually, uh, through the graphs, so you could see patterns of relations between two different, you know, between different entities in the world. Um, but significantly, what those patterns were captured were, were symbolically, and the symbolism has a very different way of encoding meaning uh, to language, which was specifically developed for the functions that it was to serve. So let's take a look at that a little bit more closely. Um, we could say, you know, it's a graph, um, its graph is a rectangular uh, hyperbola. Okay, so fine. Within the language, we've got this dense nominal group. It's called a rectangular hyperbola. We've got technical taxonomies. We've got technical language, lexis, and so forth. So impenetrable in many cases that unless you're initiated into the field, you can't understand what's going on. But something, and so it's very dense linguistically. But when you look at the symbolism, you've got something very different happening. You've got X take one, which is, you know, a, and this describes the rectangular hyperbola, the Y equals one over X take one is the mathematical description of that curve, which is named the rectangular hyperbola. But when you look at X take one, that, that is a, um, made up of a, um, a process, subtract, and you've got X take one. So you've got a configuration of mathematical participants and processes there. Now that is configured with another sort of mathematical process, which is divide. You've got one over that configuration. And that of course is another configuration. And so within the symbolism, what you've got is these embedded constructions of different processes and participants in a form which is very fluid and can easily be rearranged in order to solve problems. And so in other words, the grammar of mathematical symbolism works very, very differently to the grammar of language because it's used to serve a different sort of function. It needs to be very dynamic. It needs to be very versatile. It needs to be very fluid. So you can describe the relations and rearrange them in order to solve problems. In other words, to logically deduce you know, something uh, and, and solve problems. And of course, you've got the visual construction. Now, the whole point of showing all of this is that what's key to this is the fact that the different resources have a different underlying organization, that they make meanings very, very differently, but and you get a very powerful result when you combine them. Um, so powerful that, as I said before, the face of life on Earth has been changed as a result of basically the semiotic construction, being able to successfully map the physical world, predict it, and then build all the technologies that, that follow that including the computer and the digital age. So mathematical symbolism itself was a tool for capturing patterns and relations in the physical world with a focus on experiential and logical meaning. And what's interesting is all this was developed as a written, um, as a written form of semiosis. Um, of course, now it's expanded within the, you know, the digital realm. We've got different sorts of meanings being made in terms of dynamic visualizations and so forth, simulations, et cetera. Okay, I'm going to finish up now. It's, it's quarter two. I'm going to finish at 10 to, and that'll leave 15 minutes for questions. Um, the last part of this talk is now really looking um, at the digital age um, and this notion of matter and meaning and what it means um, in today's world. And it, it's, I think, um, my own personal view on this is at the time that semiotics sort of our field stepped up and entered into this uh, because we have got so much to offer given the issues that we're facing. These are the issues. Our lives have become extremely reliant on technology. Almost everything we do leaves a digital footprint, including what's happening right now. Uh, you've got Facebook remembering what everyone likes, um, Google Maps tracking where everyone goes, fridges assessing what's in the fridge and letting grocers know. And all of this is gathered and stored and resulting in what we've known as big data, which is semiotic. Okay, so the big tech companies and you know, um, Apple, you know, Amazon, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, um, these are the most powerful, most wealthy companies, um, probably modernity. And what they have is digital ecosystems, which provide sets of interconnected services um, in one integrated experience. And this is not by accident because then they control all the platforms. 
And so what these big companies do, and, and what we're all now aware of this, is that they collect user-generated data. They use artificial intelligence and data-driven technologies uh, for analyzing, predicting, and then modifying human uh, behavior basically for profit. But the thing is that this is not confined just to the consumer world and markets. This is now, of course, across every dimension, political, economic, um, you know, the, the collection of data and manipulating and uh, predicting human behaviour and modifying it to get a certain result. And we saw this with Cambridge Analytica and the US elections and the UK elections and so forth. But what we have now is a concentration of power, wealth, um, unprecedented in modernity and of course we've got all the serious issues in relation to trust equity and engagement and COVID has exacerbated all of this. Uh, these companies of course have become even more wealthy through the pandemic given that you know their, their dependence on online and digital environments. And uh, what Zuboff have, has called this is the age of surveillance capitalism. In other words, human behavior becomes the data uh, which is collected, analyzed, um, and then used and sold on for profit. Okay, so given this situation and where we are at, I mean, what we could think about is doing a semiotic data analytics approach. Now, why? Um, number one, it would allow us to handle the complexity of high dimensional data. In other words, human semiosis is the fourth order of complexity. It is, it is nothing much more complex than what it is. And it's very difficult to code, store, retrieve, process and analyze, um, you know, acts of semiosis to understand them um, and to visualize semiotic data or patterns and trends. Um, and also, I think, you know, if we took this sort of approach for the first time, probably in history, we could actually bring in these concepts of context and recontextualization into multimodal semiotic analysis. Because as we all know, meaning, you know, is not made, meaning is made in any context, but in any context, it's preconditioned by what's happened before. And so, you know, we really perhaps now are in a position to be able to do semiotic analysis, um, contextual, given all the information that's available and you know over history as well so the digital environment offers a lot of opportunities i think you know for for semioticians okay and at the same time if we delve into this field if we go into this field which is at the moment basically controlled by a lot of <laughs> many scientists and can you know computer linguists you know computational linguists as well but mainly in the sciences and in marketing and computer science and so forth it would allow us to start investigating what ai is uh, different machine learning techniques uh, the limitations and biases and maybe develop transparent, visual, explainable AI techniques. Because if we've got the different dimensions of human experience or the contextual factors that are configured into any instance, it's very easy to show if some of those are changed, what different result you would get. And so that whole notion of explainable AI, um, you know, where people understand what the result is and the reasons for it, allows us then to make change. And of course, at the same time, we could empirically test semiotic concepts and theories to understand how human semiosis informs, influences, mobilizes, destabilizes, and changes society, which of course it does. Um, we, you know, the two realms of the matter and meaning are interrelated, and it's human semiosis that results in, in material change. Um, and of course, then we can understand how it also functions to maintain inequalities. Okay, very, very quickly, um, artificial intelligence um, aims to create intelligent machines that simulate human thinking um, capacity and behavior. Um, machine learning is an application of AI that allows machines to learn from data without being programmed specifically. Machine learning is basically brute force. You take a whole lot of data, you look at different patterns, and then you know, results are, um, uh, are achieved. Um, you can get supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforced learning. So there's different sorts of machine learning where some learn, you know, like they're trained to take to the computers are trained to pick out certain patterns and then applied to certain data sets. Others is unsupervised where um, the computer algorithm themselves, you know, get the results. Um, but this is all used for Google search algorithms, you name it, you know, Facebook, etc. What's interesting is um, methods include deep learning where, where the layers are hidden. And this is where you get the bias, um, especially when the algorithms depend on, you know, past results and the status quo, you know, so they reinforce the status quo and the inequalities and so forth. Um, and deep learning um, is a subfield of machine learning um, where, where, as I just said, it could be supervised, unsupervised, um, 
or reinforced, and the methods, you know, are artificial neural networks. Now, what's um, important about this is these are artificial neural networks are used in a whole range for a whole range of semiotic you know, data, such as computer vision, speech recognition, natural language processing, machine learning translation, um, a, a plus in the sciences as well. Um, and it's these hidden layers in a neural network that you put in data, something happens and you get an output, but the way that the result is achieved, of course, is, is not known, it's not made explicit, and that, hence the need for explainable AI. Let's just take a quick look at one of these simulations. And, and um, I was looking at this and thought, okay, now I understand why they call it neural networks. Um, let's take a look at what they actually look like when you get a, a simulation of a neural network. What you've got in that flashing part is a handwritten sort of number, you know, one, two, three, four, five, whatever. And what it's divided into is into pixels. And so what's happening is that the algorithms are recognizing those pixels and the, the algorithms are then processing that information and then categorizing each of those numbers as one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven. So basically this is an you know, artificial intelligence of recognizing what different characters are um, through a neural network. That was a very simple neural network. Um, what we've got here is a multi-layered one where you get one set of results that gets passed on to the next part of the neural network that gets passed on to the next part of the neural network. And then you've got these classifications, you know, of the numbers one, two, three, you know, and, and so, and this is how it works, you know, and you can see now why they're called sort of neural networks with these different connections, because it's supposed to be modeled on how the human brain works. But of course it's not, it's not a biological system um, like us. And you've got different, you know, different types and, and different sorts where this works on several different layers of a simpler pattern leading up to a more complex pattern. And then, you know, the different things are classified. So these sort of networks, you know, are used in computer vision where you're recognizing human faces, you know, they're very sophisticated now, you can recognize demographics, gender and so forth. And so this is a simulation. This is um, from the internet. I'm, I didn't do this. I mean, and I've got the link um, to this. But this is what, you know, in a sense, these artificial intelligence um, algorithms look like and, and in sort of in operation. This is an interesting one, which is the spiking one, because then you do really see this notion of the human brain uh, firing away in what's called the spiking neural network. Okay, um, let's now move on. Oops, let's move back. When there's another sort of visualization of what it looks like with the same sort of idea. Okay, I'm going to finish up fairly soon now. Just to say, we've tried to sort of enter into this, this domain of artificial intelligence and machine learning um, through a project I had with John Bateman, which was based, which was funded by the Center for Interdisciplinary Research at Bellafield University in, in Germany. What we developed, um, and we've got this platform available now, um, is what's called a multimodal analysis platform. And what we did is we integrated all different existing computational tools for natural language processing, um, image processing, video processing and stuff onto one cloud-based platform um, to, in other words, bring in data, use these different algorithms to see what sort of results we were getting. So it was for real-time data collection, big data analytics and reporting. Um, and its key features is it's collaborative, so it suits um, non-data scientists, it's fully featured with natural NLP and machine learning, and it supports, you know, you bring in the data, you process it, and you get the reports, it's in the cloud, and it's open-ended plug and play, meaning it can be built upon, because what's very critical when you're looking at all these different sorts of computational techniques, um, that you can build upon them because they change so quickly. Um, there's a lot of challenges in all this, you know, um, this is, we just got to sort of stage one um, in, term, in terms of the project, you know, that you've got to get the data in, the data acquisition, there's all the infrastructure underneath it, the analytical infrastructure, and then there's all the analytics, so it's a very challenging um, challenging uh, task to do. And underneath that is a whole range of infrastructure which supports it. You know, if you've got a video, you've got to cut the video into frames and then you've got to, then, you know, basically what we were doing was we, we were changing, um, we, we were changing the metadata to textual descriptions and so forth. So, and, I mean, this is not important for the purposes of this discussion, only to illustrate there's a lot of infrastructure under something like this. And also then there's key challenges about, well, how do you represent, you know, the different semiotic resources linguistic visually and when do you combine it to look at the meanings that are made when they integrate. 
Okay, this is what it looks like. This is just the welcome page uh, of the multimodal analysis platform. Um, this is sort of a newspaper search, you know, where you get the number of newspaper articles, the counts of the articles by the date, the search results in terms of the date of publication, article title, author and stuff, all the metadata. In other words, the contextual data, which is what I was talking about before, and you get summaries. Um, this is the Twitter search page, you know, where you get the actual number of tweets and then you get uh, the number of images that accompany the tweets and you get the counts of the tweets by the date and all the metadata such as the hashtags, tweet likes and so forth. And the search results for the images that go with that as well. And you can get the images that go with the newspaper articles as well. Um, and with the images, you know, you can see thumbnails, um, you know, they get counts and, and so forth. Um, and you can see the images. Obviously, this is critical if you're doing multi, you know, multimodal semiotic analysis to see the text, to see the images. Um, what we were doing was using Clarify image processing algorithms where these algorithms, they can pick up demographics, age, race, gender, um, different clothing, um, and of course, different sorts of um, levels of nudity, whatever, you know, this is for filtering for pornography and so forth, general models uh, for different objects, themes, moods and more, and, you, you know, face uh, vehicle detectors. What you can do is put a bounding box around it. So I, we didn't do this, but I think what's really interesting is how important it is to get this visual representation of, you know, a visual, you know, of a visual image in order to see the re relations between the objects, the relative size, you can look at perspective and distance and so forth. Um, and what the what these image processing algorithms do is you get different concepts with levels, confidence levels, and you can say, well, you know, above only what results above this level. And so in this one, it's a you know people um, portrait, one person, a dot, and so forth, with very high levels of probability. Um, what you can do then in within MAP is you can classify. We've got different algorithms for classifying articles um, and then looking at sort of visualizations of clustering of those articles. Um, and you can do the sentiment analysis uh, to see, you know, positive, negative, and so forth. And um, I'm going to finish up real soon because I'm just looking at the time. We did two case studies. Uh, we looked at COVID discourses around COVID last year, newspaper, Twitter, and so forth. We looked at George Floyd. We saw the differences in the public outrage against the killing of George Floyd, where you know, it was much higher, where COVID was, you know, the public had different views on that. And we looked also at the live events program in Liverpool. Uh, basically, what happened in Liverpool is we were under lockdown. And the government announced a lives event program where if people got tested beforehand and after, they could go to big live events um, with no masks and so forth. And the whole idea was to track uh, the spread of COVID. And so what we did is we analysed the discourse from the government reports, the Liverpool City Council, online news media, social media and public comments to look at the different positionings according and the reactions to this live events program. Um, we looked at, um, and so we used NLP to look at the topics that were discussed, the sentiment, the key terms, the perceived risks and concerns, and quantitative analysis was undertaken uh, for public tweets. And, and um, the, the the live events were a live concert in a big park under a marquee and uh, nightclub events. Um, what we saw is the government and the Liverpool City Council full out endorsed the, the program. Um, you know, the, the initial reactions or the articles were classified as being to do with science about entertainment and impact and those dots show you know the, the number of articles that were classified over time um, the sentiment was extremely positive you know the government was behind this it was their program so it was Liverpool City Council um, and we looked at the images it was basically an endorsement of the city you know it was almost like a travel brochure um, and online media thoroughly endorsed the program. But it was this case it was about entertainment, impact, the arts and so forth. And you can see the big circle there on the right hand side is when the event took place and all the articles around, you know, entertainment. The positive, it was extremely high positive sentiment. Um, and the images were all celebrations of people partying and so forth. And what was interesting is the public was divided. The public did not feel the same as what the government did or as did the Liverpool City Council. Uh, there was still about entertainment, sports, um, world news and so forth. And we clustered 
you know, the different types of articles. The blue is, it was largely about entertainment, which pe some people were very excited about. But what you'll see is that in the sentiment is there's a whole spread from extremely negative to extremely positive that it over, out comes over as being uh, neutral. So I guess, you know, and then when you look qualitatively, what you'll see is that there was very criticisms about people in Liverpool being used in a government experiment and as um, lab rats and so forth. So it's very negative. Um, and the Twitter results were positive, largely because Twitter is being used by businesses and the government, uh, the public was against gaming of test results. I'm going to finish there now because we tried to do some video analysis as well, but I'm looking at the time and I can see Paul was up there ready to take questions. So I'll finish now. I guess what all this showed us um, was the limitations of NLP techniques and computer vision techniques, how limited they are, and also the need to incorporate insights from semiotics if we're going to enter into this world. And I'll finish there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, a very rich and engaging presentation. Uh, questions? Maybe people need a second to, to get their head around everything. I think we already have the first question. I can't see any questions in the chat. Um, will, you, will you read the question out or is this, where's the question coming from the audience or from um, online? Yeah, okay, uh, this is Mia Lin in the audience. Okay. Yeah, um, thank you very much for the, uh, it's really, really interesting uh, and brilliant focus in the talk. Uh, yeah, the prospect of using multimodal analysis to develop uh, explainable AI is quite fascinating uh, indeed, and the examples that you give uh, are quite compelling. I, uh, I wonder uh, if, uh, if uh, you consider in your uh, uh, in your polarization of uh, in your theoretical polarization of uh, Ages of civilization, if I recall, them. So if you consider um, what is that causes the evolution or emergence, and particularly as you were talking about the uh, a, a subject idea which maybe may you took into account, maybe you considered, is um, Jeremy Rifkin's idea that. Uh, uh, what I should see in the uh, what constitutes an industrial revolution, what I should in the new age is emerging of uh, communication media with uh, energy resources. In his idea, I would refer to industrial revolution being the emerging of um, digital network uh, media with uh, re with the energy grid, with a renewable energy grid. Because I think that. Come, may come very close to your kind of argument. Uh, it's a theory that I find much interesting because I think it, it can be very useful for developing a sustainable industry. I guess that's my question. Uh, okay, you're saying you're generally looking for an industrial revolution. Okay, it was a little bit hard to hear you because it's a little bit muffled. Paulus, can you just phrase that so I can, because your voice is very clear, but it's, from the audience, it's a bit muffled. I'm sorry, trying to rephrase it very subtly. Uh, could you comment on the role of merging communication media with uh, energy grids? In, in light of your theory of uh, 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 semiotic and uh, of, of seeing ages of civilization in terms of uh, this semiotic materi materiality in dialectics. Okay, I, I, I'm not sure I got it completely still. So it's because it's so muffled, I'm sorry. So, uh, so if, you, if you hear it better from here, maybe? Yes, they're much better. I can hear you very clearly. The question was about the, the connection between um, information technology, the information society and the power grid. 
uh, based on your semiotic uh, semiotic understanding. This is a story question, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you mean the power grid as in the political grid, or the power grid in terms of energy? <laughs> um, energy. Yeah. Um, okay. So, what do you mean in terms of um, green? You know, the different types, of, like COP twenty six. I mean, the sorts of green energy that we're talking about, um, the energy grids that, or the ways of manufacturing energy. I mean, okay. I'll put it this way: the the concerns with the material world are still there. I mean, obviously, we're still developing machines. We're still, you know, transforming energy. You know, um, and we have new forms of energy today. So that that concern has not gone away. Um, what's very interesting is the way that it is constructed and the meanings that are made out of all of that. And so, and the ways, I mean, I think the basic change is, you know, the, the, the concern with the material world is still there. It's not as if we're just in the information world and that's all we're in, um, on the contrary. Um, so the, the two realms are still there, but I guess what's changed is the way that we make meanings about them and the way that information changes and travels and, you know, the whole notion of social media and the fact, you know, of misinformation and, and so forth. So, I mean, you know, the, the, they're still, they can't be separated, the material and the, the, the realm of meaning, um, because we use all that realm of meaning to organise our whole idea about power grids and so forth and what sort of energy we should be using. So it's still there. I mean, you know, I just mean that the, I mean, the, the focus, I mean, on the information age, and you can look at this, I mean, the companies that had all the money before were the ones that were doing with the material world, the manufacturers. I mean, I'm living in Liverpool, which was, you know, so outside of the port with all the goods coming back and forth, including slavery. Um, so I guess the, the companies that have got the most money today deal with information and that shows the huge shift. But the concern with the material world is, is still there. Um, I, I don't know if I've answered your question. I hope I've come some way part to it. Thank you. Do we have uh, further questions? Please. Uh, hello. I wanted to ask uh, from the results that you have already from this previous analysis, do you think this could uh, provide some kind of a uh, predictive tool for a social um, yeah, uh, phenomena, like uh, yep. in the case of COVID, how the people will react and how uh, um, the uh, experience of, of, of the public to this kind of phenomena will uh, evolution, will evolve in, uh, during the time, uh, given certain uh, initial conditions? I think, yeah, thank you. This is, yeah, um, I think we have to understand what's happening, um, you know, and I mean, not just we, us as semioticians, I mean, everyone, the human race has to understand how information is getting circulated, how to read it, how to interpret it and so forth. Um, and in a sense, I guess, you know, I mean, it, we, I mean, the, the, the military, I mean, everyone's being interested in prediction for a very long time. I mean, I was working on a project a long time ago, and it was about predicting when there was going to be an un, unrest. Um, so in a sense, I guess you, you, you've got two, to me, two parts here. I think if we can do good semiotic analysis, it could be predictive um, in terms of looking at, you know, where something is happening and then predicting where, you know, things are going to go from there. Um, if you can get a good sense of, of where things are at. For example, the UK government <laughs> at the moment, it'd be really nice to just say, well, if this keeps going in this particular path, you know, and so forth. But of course, that's very complex because it's context-based and depends what happens. I mean, you've got, you know, the pandemic and who could have, you know, predicted even if you had really good modelling up to that stage, what would happen as a result. But certainly it is about predictions, that, you know, um, trying to avoid certain situations if need be. It, but for me, it's also understanding it um, understanding human semiosis, understanding the world of meaning, which has been relegated always to a secondary position because of the concern of the material world, because that's where the wealth lied, that's where the money went in science and so forth, science, technology and so forth. Now, of course, we're in a different realm now. So I just feel that we need to step up to understand what's going on with information, how it's being passed around, semi human semiosis today, um, to look at, you know, these sorts of algorithms that are being used and they may be basic, and they are. I mean, you know, the stuff that I looked at, when you're looking at the, uh, the linguistic analysis, 
um, it's basically at the word group, you know, I mean, very fundamental type sort of linguistic analysis, nothing to do with the sort of knowledge that we have about how language works. And same with the imagery, it's very, very basic, you know, objects and sort of, you know, themes and so forth. Even though they're so basic, they are so powerful. Um, because basically, if you can map what people are doing, and this is what all these algorithms do, you know, this is why Google, I mean, it maps every single thing, then they get a very good profile of individuals and can predict very well and can nudge people in certain sorts of behaviour. So I guess it's, you know, it's, it's just a matter of coming and understanding what's happening and also educating people for the future, our own students, you know, the type of research we're doing to cope with this world, which is, you know, I mean, it's the power play today, you know, through information. So, yeah. So I just think it's hugely significant. And I think that semi our field, I mean, it's critical today. And I think we've got a long way to go to, to get the position of being able to contribute to the debate and opening it up so people understand what's happening. Excellent, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do we have one more quick question behind there? Um, and questions online. Uh, uh, there were no more in the chat, or are there? Yeah. Juan Felipe wanted to ask a question. Oh, ah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah, if I may. Uh, Sorry, wrong okay. button. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, yes, um, I, I, I was very interested in your talk and, and uh, especially in this part where you were talking about Leibniz and philosophy and representation using language uh, images and also like um, equations, right? Yeah. And I was wondering what your views are on how philosophy is conducted today. I'm thinking particularly about analytic philosophy because there has been a sort of the tendency of, uh, okay, structure and arguments very carefully, but usually it's mostly texts, right? Yeah. Philosophers, at, at least compared to cognitive sciences, they, they don't tend to use diagrams. Yes. And I wonder if you've addressed them as an audience with these ideas. <laughs> I don't know if they have reacted to them in any way but I, I think that much better philosophy could be done if we had more representational mechanisms at play in, in a paper right <clears throat> couldn't agree more I mean yeah definitely I mean there's so much going on what's interesting was the focus has been on language historically because that was the means of communication it was a printing press and you have images and so forth you know um but of course now so much meaning and <laughs> arguments are made visually and also visual imagery is becoming much more sophisticated because of the digital environment you know you've got i mean basically you know kidney simulations and dynamic visualizations and so forth and the power of the visual is just increasing you know like as human symbiosis changes over time of course the visual you know the power of the visual is increasing today so definitely you know if you had then philosophy at but, you know, you know, you've raised actually a real point that I've been thinking about quite a lot. If philosophy was a discipline that, that actually used all the different resources, you'd have a different sort of philosophy. Can you imagine um, maths and science was, was hugely successful because it developed a new semiotic resource, basically the symbolism, which worked together with them. Philosophy could also expand. But can you imagine how semiotics could expand if we developed a new semiotic resource to explain the world of meaning? Because at the moment, the whole problem is, is we're depending on semiotic resources that were developed to explain the material world, not the world of meaning. I think we need new semiotic resources. That's really the challenge. Uh, because this world of meaning is still so elusive, the tools that we've got were not designed for the purpose that we need them for. Super interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Should we put the line there, maybe, or should we take one more? I mean, I'm looking at uh, at organizers uh, who have the. Maybe you can take because there is one more uh, hand up uh, online. Yeah. So maybe Amelia. Take yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Thank you. That was a really interesting talk. Um, and I was just wondering what I got from that and the way everything's gone. I mean, one of the things that struck me was the recent attempts to sell NHS data with the opt out rather than the opt in. And just listening to all that, would it be fair to say we're almost being farmed for data? Yeah. Because it's like everything's become mass, this mass produced, mass, this mass responses. It's like individualism has gone and just listening to what you were saying that seems to be it's almost like intensive farming <laughs> do you know the best book on or well, one of the good books is is Zuboff on this what she says is that human behavior you know our own personal experience you know in terms of everything that we do which is tracked now 
is now used for data for profit. Basically, the human experience has been sold. Um, you know, and it's coming, you know, about this, it's coming more and more to the fore, you know, like Facebook is now under a lot of scrutiny. Uh, but basically what all they were doing was collecting data about everyone and their relations and what they liked and didn't like, and then processing that into a profile and selling it on. Um, but it's into the political realm as well. I mean, Cambridge Analytica had profiles of everyone, you know, using data supplied by Google or Facebook to, to model different demographics and then send certain messages to them. So we are being found. There's no doubt about that. That's being recognised at the moment because everything we do has got a trace. And these companies have all that data. They have more data about everyone than ever before. And they're using it and they're modelling it, you know, for different purposes and they're selling it. Um, and we just, you know, I mean, it, it has become more evident now, um, you know, human uh, sort of we're becoming aware of this now, but certainly, you know, for decades it wasn't. And I read Zuboff makes a really important point that the reason the Google and that could get so powerful was after September the 11th, what the US realised is they didn't have access to all the data about everyone and they wanted better databases and modelling who everyone was. So they were, they were given a whole range of powers. But I mean, these companies now, I mean, it's incredible what they've got and how they use it um, and what sort of modelling they're doing and what sort of results they're getting and how that gets fed back. And I just remember in my abstract, and I'm glad you've mentioned this, Amelia, because in the abstract, what I said is that the digital world is a one-way mirror and that's how I look at it. We're looking at a screen now and that's a one-way mirror. We see something. What we're not seeing is what's going on behind it and how we're getting fed back stuff. So it's a one-way mirror with these companies looking back at us and feeding different things to us. Um, and us not being aware of it. And this is where we need explainable intelligence, artificial intelligence. Wow, that's chilling. Thank you. I know. It is. Read, read the age of surveillance capitalism. It really changes the way you think about things. Thank you. Thank you so much for this presentation, for the very engaged discussion. I will just use my privilege for 10 seconds to say that this might be an argument to teach the kids to code and they give people a bit more insight and teach them, let them learn how to break the systems or at least understand how the systems work. Absolutely. We've introduced some new master's programs, AI and communication, media, data and society to address this very issue. Um, you know, with different levels of awareness about what's happening. You know, people, we have some modules which are shared with computer science. We just started this program next year, actually. Um, so yeah, definitely, definitely. And also trained semioticians too. Even if you don't have to be able to do it, but you have to understand it and work with people that do have the knowledge. Yeah. Thank so you. thank you very much, everybody. And I will then leave the floor to the organizers uh, to go on to the next session. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It was a real pleasure. And thanks for the questions. They were terrific.